Hello everyone, welcome to COMP382. Um, this is the second video about the deterministic finite automata. Um, in this video, we are going to um, show how we can prove um, a DFA that we design is actually accepting the, a language that uh, we are asking. Or basically just showing that how um, if a DFA is accepting a language, you should be able to actually prove that uh, this DFA accept the language. Remember, this was the last example from the previous lecture. Uh, we created a DFA uh, for um, this language, um, the language of strings defined over the alphabet uh, ABC, um, that uh, all the strings that has at least two Cs. Uh, we basically defined uh, uh, three states, Q0 um, that has seen um, zero number of Cs, Q1 that has seen uh, just exactly one number of C, and Q2 that has at least two number of Cs. We have designed this um, DFA. We just wanted to make sure that this is really um, accepting the language. When we are saying a DFA accepts a language, um, we usually have uh, two things to prove. We have to prove that all of the strings in this set are going to be accepted by the design DFA and every string which is accepted by the design DFA is going to be in the uh, set. So basically it's going to have two parts, although I'm going to show you a technique that we will do it in basically one go. But before that, we need a couple of actually notations um, to be able to write down our proof um, in a nice, uh, you know, mathematical manner. Remember this um, delta function, the transition function that we defined uh, when we formally defined the deterministic finite state? Um, delta is a function that maps um, a state and... Um, a token, uh, sorry, um, I mean an input uh, symbol to um, another state, uh, which basically tells you that if you are at, for example, a state Q0 and you see the token A, you will go to a state Q0 or actually a stay at Q0, right? Um, or for example, um, this transition that says, uh, if you are at a state Q1 and you see a symbol C in the input, you go to a state Q2. Okay, here I'm going to extend this um, delta notation and uh, define another notation which is called delta hat. Um, this one is going to actually help us to summarize and write down this fact that, okay, if I'm at some a specific state and I see a sequence of inputs, not just one symbol, where is going, what is going to be the final state that um, I am in, by final, I mean the last state that I will end up to. Um, so if I am at a state Q0 and I see a, a string of tokens, uh, you can see that in this formal definition, I have written it as um, the sigma star. So any strings of the defined over the alphabet, uh, where I will be um, after I, uh, I read this string from Q0. If I read, for example, this string, where I will be. So to answer this question, you can actually simply see that Okay, by 1a, you will be, you can just follow it. By 1a, you will be, um, just write it down for yourself, q0, you will actually stay at q0. If you see a b, I will, let me just write down them here. If you see a b, you will be at q0 again. If you see a c, you will be at um, q1. Uh, if you see the next A, you will stay at Q1. If you see a B, you will stay at Q1. If you see the next B, you will stay at Q1. Okay, so the final answer here is going to be Q1. So this notation, the delta hat, I needed um, to just write down my proofs and it basically makes everything much simpler for me. So I need to define this notation, the 
uh, delta hat. Um, so I have a question here for you that, um, okay, if I am at Q0 and I see, uh, okay, and, and the uh, input, um, sorry, the yeah. string that I see is going to be this um, epsilon, basically nothing, what is going to be, where I'm going to be, definitely I will be actually staying at Q0, right? So uh, it is possible to write down this um, uh, sigma, uh, sorry, the epsilon here, and basically it just means that you haven't seen anything and you are not actually going anywhere. So whatever is going to be the state in that case is going to be the result of the delta hat. Uh, here the thing is we basically usually um, abuse the notation delta and instead of writing delta hat, uh, you can even see in your textbook that we um, just stick to the symbol uh, delta instead of delta hat and so everywhere we are um, actually going to refer to something like okay the delta um, q0 and a string just for example a b c a something like this a full let me just remove the quotations a b c a something like this we just meant delta hat um, so just this is just a note that whenever you see this don't be confused we rarely use that actually delta hat um, we just reuse the delta instead of that um, here is um, some actual examples that for example if you the answer of if you are at q2 and you see um, a string like this what is going to be the answer a b c if you are at q2 um, just follow the transitions as simple as that. So you see an A, you will stay at Q2. You see a B, you will stay at Q2. I don't actually need to follow all of these um, cases. It is, I mean, if you look at the transitions here, you can see that uh, if you are at Q2 for all of the input symbols, you will stay at Q2. So whatever is going to be the string here, you can just simply find the answer here that's going to be Q2. Or for example, if you are at Q1 and you see a string like this, where you are going to end up at Q1, um, it, the transitions here, if you look at the transition, you can see that if the strings that you are seeing is going to be just the combination of A and B, you will stay at Q1. Um, the only way that you leave Q1 and go somewhere else is go to C, you know, um, a token of C that I don't have a token of C here. So the result here is going to be um, Q1. Okay, another notation that here I need to define is, um, this is not a total notation actually, this is uh, a definition, a state invariant. You have already actually done this, but now I'm going to give you the formal definition of that. A state invariant basically is going to be, um, you know, a predicate um, that you define it for each state. And... Uh, so it this predicates is just saying that if you um, have a string and a starting from Q0, you reach to, you by reading this string, you reach to, for example, the state Q, definitely the state invariant for that, um, uh, different, um, I mean, the state invariant that you define for that state is going to be true for that string. And it also actually is going to tell us that if um, you have a string, that the state invariant is true for that string, you are sure that if you start from Q0 um, and you just pass um, this transition, this um, string to the, to the DFA, you would end up to the state Q. So this is exactly what is the definition of the states that uh, we have done when we um, actually try to solve those examples. We define some definition for those states, right? Those definitions that we wrote are actually the state invariant for those states. Um, it is, uh, I mean, formally, a state invariant for a state Q is going to be a predicate PW. 
such that for every string in the alphabet, I mean a string that has been created from the alphabet, if you started from Q0 and reading W, you would reach Q if and only if PW is true. So this if and only if has actually saying two parts. It is telling you that if you, um, for all the W strings which um, uh, reach to the state Q, definitely the uh, predicate PW is going to be true. And all the strings which are satisfying this predicate, you are sure that if you start from Q0, you definitely reach to the state Q. Okay, so this definition is if and only definition, so be careful about that. So, state invariants are going to have some properties. When you are designing the DFA, you basically need to design the state invariant for every state. This is exactly what we have already done. So, I just, um, here I'm giving you the, the formal definition of what we have done. When we are creating our um, DFA in all of those previous examples that I showed you, we, we basically defined a couple of states. We write down the definition for those states. Those definitions are the state invariants, um, right? And then um, basically based on that, you create the DFA at the end. So the whole DFA was just that set of state invariants that you write down for your state. So, and then um, of course you added the transitions between them, but the main thing which is important was those state invariants. When you are designing your DFA, uh, when you are designing the state invariance, when you are writing the definition for your state invariance, you should be careful about the state invariance. Um, they should actually have a couple of um, basically two main properties. The first property is that uh, when you are writing your state invariance, you should be careful that. Um, you cannot find any string that uh, satisfies more than one state invariant. If that's the case, it's just like you are designing a DFA that for one string, these strings can be in two different states. It can be in Q1 and or it can be in Q2. Okay, and it's not possible. This is this makes your DFA wrong. This makes your DFA not working actually properly. It doesn't going to actually. Um, it's just like you are writing a program, that for, um, you know, um, an input is supposed to just give you a, a unique answer, and it's just giving you two different answers. It's um, something similar to that. So you should be careful that first when you are designing your state invariants, um, all of the strings should exactly satisfy one um, state invariant. Um, let me actually give you an example here. Um, just assume that I have um, designed two states Q1 and Q2 that one of them is um, uh, the state invariant is that W has at least two, C, two zeros and the other one is saying W has at least three zeros. So clearly here you can see that by this state invariants if I see for example, a string like 0, 0, 0, it is satisfying Q1, and it is also satisfying Q2, which is not possible. After reading um, your string, you should actually end up to one of these states. Uh, exactly one state, actually. Okay, so this is a bad design. The other property that you should follow is that all of the possible strings in the alphabet should satisfy at least one state invariant. I mean, I should say not at least, exactly one state invariant. So in this way, it doesn't matter what is the input string, you end up to one of the states and exactly one of the states. So it makes your um, finite automata actually a deterministic finite automata as well. Okay, so let me show you an example of a bad design here as well. Just assume that I have designed a DFA with exactly two states, only two states. Q1 is a, a state uh, that with a state invariant saying W has exactly 
two zeros and q2 is the state invariant uh, with the state invariant saying w has at least three zeros so in this case you can see that there are some strings in assume that the alphabet is a binary alphabet um, so the strings which doesn't have any zero where they are going to end up which states that they are going to be to represent this set of strings none of these two states are actually representing them so you are missing some um, strings again this is going to be a bad design you have to have a state for um, that represent every possible string over the alphabet okay let me show you some examples here in this um, simple DFA, what are going to be the state invariants for Q0 and Q1? You can see that um, if you just um, try some examples over this DFA, um, you will see whenever you um, start, you are going to be at a state Q0 and you will stay at Q0 uh, if you don't see any one, or if you see two ones, or if you see four ones, or if you see six ones, so basically it's just telling you that all of those strings that has even number of ones are going to end up Q to Q0, right? Because whenever you see a one, you are actually moving to Q1 and seeing another one is just going, um, returning back you to Q0. So Q0 is going to be, um, the state invariant for Q0 is that um, W has even number of ones and for Q1 it's going to be W has odd number of ones. And this is the way that we write the state invariants in this case. Now let's get back to our example. We wanted to show that the, um, Basically, the DFA that we have designed was accepting the exactly the string the uh, language uh, which was given in the question. Uh, so the first step to prove um, that a DFA is accepting a language is to write down the um, state invariant for all of the um, states. Then after finding the state invariants for all of the states, we have to define a, um, actually this um, a statement, which is going to be a statement defined over the length of the strings, um, length of all of the strings. For example, um, if you have a string of length n, um, what you are going to prove at the end is going to be something like this, that this machine accepts, you have to prove this statement that this machine, this deterministic coordinate state is accepting all strings of length n with at least two c's. And not only you have to um, prove this one, but also you have to prove that this machine will reject all strings of length n that doesn't have um, two zeros. Um, I shouldn't actually, I, um, I mean, I should probably just makes it more precise and say that um, has less than two zeros, not doesn't have two zeros. But anyway, just uh, accept it from me here. It's just a matter of just this wording. But so the first step is that I wanted to write down the state invariance for this um, to be able to prove this statement. I need to first write down the state invariants, but and then by proving the state invariants for all the strings of length n, I'm done with this proof. For all the um, strings of length n, if all of the state invariants are correct, so we will see that this is going to this DFA is going to accept um, the language. So first of all, what are going to be the state invariants? Remember, the state invariants actually were the definition of the states that we wrote. So for Q0, the state invariant is going to be, remember, we designed Q0 for all the um, strings that hasn't seen any C yet. 
Q1, it was going to be representing all those strings that has seen exactly one C. And Q2 uh, was going to represent all those strings that has seen at least two Cs. Okay, these are basically these are state invariants that I have written were just the definition of the states that we have written in the previous uh, video. So know that I have the state invariants. By looking at the state invariants, I can clearly see that the state invariants are telling me that because only Q2 is a final state and the Q2, the state invariant for Q2 clearly tell me that um, this is accepting all the um, but, uh, all the strings with at least two uh, Cs and the other states Q1, Q0 and Q1 are covering this. all of these state invariants basically covering all possible strings okay, all possible strings in this alphabet and only Q2 is final um, state only Q2 is an accepting state and this is exactly what are those strings that we want so if I can prove the state invariants are correct for every string of length n, I'm done with the proof because everything which are end up to q0, q1 are going to be the ones which are rejecting, which um, have been rejected, and all those which are going to be ended up to q2, they are going to be accepted. So I'm done. What I need to do here is that I have to prove for any string of length n, the state invariants are going to be correct. The state invariants are going to be satisfied. So how to do this proof? I'm going to use the inductive proof. Um, actually, this makes it pretty much easy. You can see that the proof the what I am going to do is that proving, um, I mean, all of s strings of length n. So my proof is going to be based on this variable n, which is the length of the s string. So the base in this case is going to be uh, I should find the smallest um, length that um, this statement is going to be satisfied for. Of course, we are going to prove for all of the strings all possible strings so the smallest value of n is going to be zero right which shows that for empty string uh, we should show that the state invariants um, has been satisfied you can see that for the state um, epsilon a state uh, sorry for a string epsilon um, a string of length um, zero um, where are you going to be if you are, you should start from Q0 by not reading anything, basically by having the epsilon as your input. Um, so basically you will stay at Q0, right? So uh, the state invariant has been um, satisfied. Uh, M, uh, sorry, the epsilon is not going to have at least two zeros, so it's going to be rejected. And you are at Q0, and Q0 is a rejecting a state and we are done with proving that yes the all the state invariants are uh, satisfied uh, for um, the base case which is the n equal to zero now the inductive step in the inductive step i should i have an assumption or induction hypothesis um, is telling us that we assume all strings of length k are satisfying the state invariants, okay? And uh, then we have to prove that for all strings of length k plus 1, also the uh, state invariants are satisfied, based using actually this assumption. So this is our assumption, and I have to prove that for all strings, of length k plus 1, also um, the state invariants um, are satisfied. So any string of length k plus 1, I can write it down as any string w of length k plus 1, I can write it as a string, a prefix, a string of length k, and 
just you know just take um put your last symbol away that's let's just call it r okay so any s string w prime hat is going to be the concatenation of s string w which the length of the string is k and just concatenate a symbol to the end of it that this symbol is going to be one of the symbols from the alphabet it can be either a b or c so now i am going to cover all these different cases that um, r is going to be a r is going to be b r is going to be c okay and for all of these cases you should actually think about w w is going to have three possibilities based on the state invariance in this dfa either w is going to satisfy this state invariant or this one or this one remember the state invariants for the DFAs are covering all the strings and they are completely disjoint. So each string is going to satisfy exactly one of these state invariants. So at the end, I'm going to cover nine different cases, all the cases for W and all the possibilities, all the cases for R as well. Okay, I'm going to show you all of these nine different cases one by one. The first, assume that um w is such that it satisfies the uh, okay the state invariant for q0 okay i have written it in a reverse way um from q i have started actually this i have written these cases from q2 it doesn't really matter let's just start from q2 and just follow the slides i will first assume that okay um w are satisfying the the last state invariant so it means that it has if you started from q0 by reading w you will reach to q2 okay so this is going to be the situation that i have the case that i have in this case what does actually the state invariant tells me about w it tells me that w has at least two zeros two c's sorry so if w has two c's definitely w prime is going to has at least two c's right it doesn't matter what is the value of r w prime is going to have at least two c's so for all the possible values of r w prime is going to still satisfy the um, this state invariant right and it means that it is going to um, actually be an accepting, uh, sorry, it is going to be a string from the language, right? And if you follow the transitions in the DFA, also you will see that by reading W, you will reach to W, you will reach to Q2, right? And then by reading R, it doesn't matter if R is A, B, or C, you will stay at Q2. So that's it. I'm done with proving that. Uh, this part, the actually last case, uh, the sorry, the first case for W. If W, uh, the first case for, for W prime, if W is going to uh, be satisfying this state invariant, W prime is going to also satisfy the same state invariant and it's going to be um, a string from the language. And we are done with this case. The other case is that what if w is a string that um, if you actually read it uh, from uh, starting from q0 you end up to q1 if it is the case it means that it is satisfying the assumption tells me that all the state invariants are satisfied right so it's telling me that pw is going to have exactly one c okay so if you have exactly one c everything will uh, for w prime everything will depend on r so in this case i have um, basically two different cases if r is equal to c w prime is going to have two c's so it is going to satisfy this state invariant w prime is going to satisfy this state invariant which is going to be q2 and also, if you look at the transition, you can see that from Q1, if you see 1C, you, can, you will go to Q2. So that's it. 
if you start from Q0, you reach W prime, you will end up to Q2. The DFA is telling you that and uh, the state invariants are also satisfied. The other case is that W um, starting from Q0 ends up to Q1, right? Which means that you have exactly one C and the last symbol, the the R that you are actually reading is going to be either A or B. In both cases, W prime is still going to have exactly one C, right? So it's going to just satisfy this state invariant. So W prime is satisfying this state invariant. And not only that, when you are looking at the transitions, the transitions tells you that if you are at Q1 and you see A or B, you will stay at Q1. So in total, if you start from Q0, by reading W prime, you will end up to Q1, exactly the same state invariant. So I have proved the second case. I'm done with this one. And the last case was that if you read the um, W starting from Q0 and you end up to Q0. So if it is the case, it means that this state invariant is true for W. W has zero number of Cs. Again, in this case, I have two possibilities. Um, actually, I have three possibilities. I'm just combining the two of them here. One possibility is that if R is C, it means that although W doesn't have any C, but at the end you are having a C, so W prime is going to have exactly one C. What is the state invariant? This is going to be the state invariant equivalent to actually this state invariant for Q1, right? And if you look at the transitions, it's telling you that if you are at Q0 and you see 1C, it actually moves you to Q1. So I'm done with this part. The other part is that if R is A or B, if R is A or B, W doesn't have any C and R is not C, so W prime is not going to have any C. So it's going to satisfy this state invariant. Also, the transitions showing me that if you are at Q0 and um, you see an, another A or B, you will stay at Q0. So this state invariant has been proved as well. Okay, so we are done with the proof. Basically, what we have done here is that we have showed that for all strings of length n, um, the state invariants, all of them are satisfied. Okay, and we basically actually showed both sides of the way that all of the state invariants um, covering, um, I mean, the state invariants that we have are covering all the possible strings, right? And the definition of the state invariants clearly tell me that only those ones that end up to Q2, which is the only final accepting a state, are going to be exactly the definition of the strings that we are looking for. And if the string end up here or end up here, we don't want this string to be in the language. They are, I mean, those strings are not going to be a part of the language. So they are going to be rejected and they are going to be end up to Q0 or Q1. And so this is going to be the, the full proof. So you should actually be a little bit careful when you are writing the proof in these cases. First of all, you should find the state invariants. So this is a must be careful when you are writing your state invariants. You are given a DFA, you wanted to write the state invariants. You should be careful that you are writing a state invariants, um, you know, clearly and uh, correctly. Otherwise, the whole proof is going to be uh, wrong at the end. So first, find the state invariants, then prove the state invariants. The, how to prove the state invariants? Prove it using induction over the length of the string. You, um, definitely, the base case always here is going to be when the string is empty, the length of the string is zero, then um, just prove the induction step. During the induction steps, you should consider all possible cases, all the state invariants and all the uh, alphabet, all, all the symbols in the alphabet, um, and uh, you will be done. I mean, if you just follow all of these steps, you would be 
sure that um, the proof is complete and covering everything. So let me show you a couple of other. Um, I'm done with that proof, so I'm not going to do another example of the proof. I think that will kill you. Um, these are actually a couple of examples of um, some um, DFAs uh, for, um, I mean, DFA for some very well-known languages, for example, the MT um, language. When we, I'm, I'm saying an empty language, I'm talking about a set, right? An empty set doesn't have any, uh, any member, right? So no string will be accepted by um, the, the DFA that you design here. I can create it using exactly just one state. Um, this is going to be the starting state and all of, sorry, here, the... the the alphabet is binary so for 0 and 1 um, you always stay at q0 there is no final state so basically this dfa is not accepting any string it doesn't matter what is your string it always stays at stay at q0 and q0 is not an accepting state um, let's just create a dfa for this string uh, sorry, this um, language, this language has only one member and that member is going to be um, empty string. So I can create a DFA for this one using two states, um, Q0, the starting state, and I will make it accepting as well, okay? By zero or one for both transitions, you go to another state and you will stay here for every other actually um, input that you read. Uh, so this DFA is going to accept the only empty string. It doesn't accept anything else. Um, so this language, this language is basically just telling you that every possible string over the alphabet are uh, going to be accepted, including empty string, right? Again, I can create a DFA for this one using exactly sorry, using exactly one state um, Q0. Oh my God, this is a really bad handwriting. Q0. I will actually make it an accepting state, and for every zero and one, and you read you will stay at this accepting the state. So empty string will be accepted because Q0 is accepting and for anything else that you read, you will stay there. And so this is going to accepting everything. This set is the set of all binary strings except the empty string. So you should at least have some um, read something. So for this one, I can design a DFA like this that Q0 is not going to be accepting, then by any zero or one, you move to Q, for example, Q1, make it an accepting state, and you stay here for any zero and one. Okay, so these are the, some examples here. Let me show you two other examples before ending this, um, actually lecture um, the set of all binary strings that has um, which actually started with n number of zeros and followed uh, which are followed by m number of uh, ones the number of the n and m are going to be greater than or equal to zero right uh, so basically all of these strings are going to be in the language um, empty string because when n and m both of them are going to be zero this is going to be empty um, right uh, a single zero a single one double zero so if n or m either of them is going to be zero so all of those strings which are just a sequence of zeros or just a sequence of ones all of them are going to be a part of this string and basically any number of zeros followed by any number of ones. And there is no relationship between n and m. It's just clearly telling you that there is no relationship between n and m. 
How can I create a DFA for this case? Um, I can just follow those um, steps by writing down some definitions, some state invariant for states as well, but I'm going to skip that step and make it faster writing down the example for this case. So um, basically, um, I am going to create a starting state just and make it a, an accepting state as well. Whenever I am actually seeing a zero, I will I want it to actually stay at Q zero. It's just like I'm following and I'm actually uh, reading all of those zeros at the beginning. Whenever I see a one, it's just like you are moving to reading the ones, right? So by reading a one, I am going to move to another state, Q one. Again, I'm going to make it an accepting state and stay here for all the ones that you are reading. But if all of a sudden you have another zero after the one, so for example, zero, one, zero, is it going to be in the language? No, right? So I'm going to create another state for all those type of strings that after reading the one, they have, it doesn't matter how many, for example, all these strings are going to be, as a, if you have a one, zero, this is not in the language, right? And uh, again, it will end up to, it's just like you are at Q1 and then you see a zero. If after reading a one, you see a zero, you should reject that string. So I'm going to create another state, Q2, that from Q1, by reading a zero, you are moving to that state and I'm going to stay there forever. So, if whatever else you read, you will stay at Q2 and it is going to be a rejecting um, a state because it never, it doesn't have any path to an accepting a state. We usually actually call this type of states a dead state. You can see that if you end up to this state, it's no way that you can skip. So this is going, that's why they call it a dead state. So that's it. This is going to be a DFA for this language. You can see that I can even write down the state invariance for this state. So Q0, the state invariant for this, for Q0, is going to be something like um, W has uh, no one. So it's basically going to be either empty or all the uh, those strings which are only zero. So they are going to end up to Q0. And this is the um, state invariant. Why did I write this one? I don't know. Okay. The other state that I have is Q1. The state invariant for this one can be something like, let me see, W has... Uh, n number of which n is going to be greater than or equal to zero so it's covering everything um, number of zeros and followed by at least one one Because you can see that you should have seen at least one one to end up to Q1, right? If you haven't seen any one, you will stay at Q0. And this, is fine, uh, this um, I mean, uh, a state invariant is going to satisfy that. So for Q1, W is going to be um, all the strings that has N greater than or equal to zero, number of zeros followed by... at least one, one, okay? And Q2 is going to be all the string that has the pattern one, zero. 
okay it might not be quite a straightforward for to for you to get this one but um you know if you see this pattern one zero you will actually go to q2 just try it all the possible cases that you if you see anywhere the pattern q0 you will end up to q2 and you would stay there and you would never get out of it so these are all the state invariants for these states so let me show you another example uh, we wanted to build a dfa for this language this is kind of similar to the previous example but the difference is that the number of zeros and ones i want them to be equal in the previous case i said n number of zeros followed by m number of ones and there is no relationship between n and m uh, i don't know how many number of zeros or how many number of ones and any number of zeros followed by any number of ones but in this example i am going to actually ask to make it equal number of zeros and ones so epsilon again is going to be in the language this is going to be zero number of zeros and zero number of ones one number of zeros and one number of ones this here n is going to be one and so on so two number of zeros two number of ones three number of zeros three number of ones think about this problem for just a few minutes uh, you can pause the video and then come back and actually listen to my answer uh, because I wanted you really to think about this one. Okay, so if I want to create a DFA for this um, language, I would see that it's not possible. Yeah, simply this is an example of a language which is not a regular language and it is not possible to create a DFA for that. Um, the reason basically is that it is very intuitive here. I have um, you know, a proof for you as well written. I'm not going to go through this proof, although I would recommend you to go through it. The reason that I'm skipping it here is that um, when we are talking about the properties of a uh, um, uh, regular languages i will give you another way um, to prove the that for example a language is not a regular language using we call it actually pumping lemma um, so but this uh, i mean proof here is going to help you to digest the idea um, even if you don't know about the pumping lemma then actually that uh, formal uh, important uh, way to prove them um, you can just get the idea that why um, or for example if you um, are given a language you understand that it is it possible to create a dfa for this one or not some of the problems that we are given um, they are regular language but maybe the writing a dfa for that is not quite easy but you should just think about the properties of your language if the, you can write a deterministic finite state for for that or not or basically you can create a finite state for that or not when we are saying it, you have to create a finite state it is important that the number of a state is going to be finite in this language when you are looking at the, the definition of the language it is telling you that n number of zeros followed by n number of ones so you have to make sure the number of zeros and the number of ones are going to be equal okay so if you are going to do that um, how many states you are going to create to make sure that how many zeros you have um, actually uh, read so far um, can you give me the number is there a finite number of states to be able to count the number of zeros this language is telling you that n number of zeros followed by n number of ones without putting any restrictions over n so n is going to be basically any number greater than or equal to zero there is no limitation for n n can go to infinity so it's not possible for me to create a finite state to create a dfa you know an automata with finite number of states because the number of zeros that you read is going to be important 
I need to count the number of zeros. So at the end, I would actually match them to the number of ones. In the previous example, although this example looks very similar to the previous example, but it is inherently different. In the previous example, the number of zeros and the number of ones, there was no relationship between them. So I don't care if it, I just read zero number of zeros or I read a million number of zeros. I, I don't care about the number of zeros. So only one state is going to be enough to represent them. Q0 always by reading zeros, you would stay there and that's it. You don't need to count the number of zeros. If I care that how many zeros I have, I need to have distinct number of actually states for each number of zeros that I'm going to count, right? Like the previous examples that we cared about the number of Cs, you see that this one showing zero number of C, this one showing one number of C, this one showing two number of Cs and more. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, all of them are going to be represented by this one. But because I care about counting the number of Cs from zero to two, I need three states. If I cared about, for example, three number of uh, Cs, I would need four states. Okay, so this makes it this um, actually language to be a not non-regular language or irregular language. I, I don't know that which term is basically correct in terms of a computational models, but anyway, this language is not a regular language. We cannot create a finite state uh, for that because it's not possible to create an automata that has finite number of states with these properties, I mean, uh, a DFA that has finite number of states and reads the input from left to right only once. So here I'm going to actually um, stop recording this uh, video, stop this video. This is going to be the last video. The lectures that I have posted on Blackboard has many examples at the end with solution. I put all of the solutions here. There are many interesting examples. Just make sure that you go through them. Um, and if you had any question, we will discuss about it during the office hours.